welcome to the Natural Order Podcast with your hosts, Brian O'Leary and Adam Heyman. Welcome back to the Natural Order Podcast. Actually, I don't even know if I was supposed to lead this off, but I did anyway. I, Brian O'Leary here with you with Adam Heyman. Hey, Brian. Hello, Adam. And we've got what we think is an interesting discussion ahead of us. We'll see how it how it goes. We touched a little bit on it in the last episode, I believe it was, about this idea of equity versus equality and how I, I don't know. I would it, it's a it's a strange it's a strange thing and I think I think we're supposed to get all worked up over it. And after talking about this idea with Adam, we said we we need to do a show on this because equity and equality, well they're fighting about it over there. We don't think it's even something worth scrimmaging over. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a false dichotomy or a Everyone's got their panties in a bunch over the standard classical goal, equality of opportunity or something like that, Mm -hmm. versus this new goal, you know, equity. All people should be equal in X, Y, and Z dimension, most notably economically. And I think both of those choices are sort of bad because they're imposed by some authority. Right. It's not equality versus equity. It's both of those opposed to freedom. Just the the natural order that emerges from a free society of free people interacting according to their own values and and choices. But let's get into the the definitions. What are these people talking about when they talk about equity? Yeah, the forced idea of equity or even equality, like you're saying, it's just antithetical to freedom because it's a top-down imposed idea or wanting us to be persuaded in in that direction. So which one of these uh, do you want to drill into first? Pick your poison. Let's talk about equality really quickly. I think most people understand, at least inherently, I would say equality, right? Equality. Well, I usually start my analysis of this issue sort of from the founding of the country. Right. And I think back then, the idea people had of all the citizens being equal you know, having equality was a unobjectionable one. It's just equality before the law. Sure. As far as government force is concerned, nobody has any preferential status. Everyone is it's not equal even equality the law. of opportunity or equality no, of that outcome. Came later. That came later. The first slippery concept was adding equality of opportunity, which is bad because mm-hmm. it changes free association. It would require. Uh, some racist, for example. State or quality of being equal. <laughs> one equals one. Two equals two. It would require the state to intervene into free choices if they thought that some group or some person even wasn't given equal opportunity in the marketplace. And that's just, <laughs> that's not the camel's nose under the tent. That's the whole camel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. And then you said the new term, equity. Well, equity is what the same root structure as equality. It's a bit different. I would say I would probably argue that the meaning is very new or relatively new. I wrote an article actually about it in it's like 2011, I want to say, and it was published in the Oregonian, I believe. It's on their website, and it had to do with the city of Portland where I lived at the time. They established an office of equity, which the title, which I didn't necessarily choose, but it says office of equity, fine principle, waste of time. Now I would go, I would probably edit myself here and uh, say, I don't even think equity is a fine principle. (laughs) It's terrible. (laughs) Yeah. And then even later on in the piece, I say that uh, maybe even laissez-faire economic uh, freedom is not and I, I, even right after writing that, I was like, yeah, I, I think so. I've, I've changed a, a few of my views, but I, what I haven't changed is how silly this whole idea of equity or because the, the idea being that everybody, everybody has the equal outcomes, I think, is ultimately the easiest way to define equity here. Yeah, that's what they mean. And I that's think what it's they a, mean. It's not even definable. <laughs> it's another bait and switch. 
like when the, the first trick was taking equality before the law and transmuting that into equality of opportunity. On well, here, they're saying, well, screw opportunity. Let's just make sure everyone has roughly the same outcomes. I mean, why should one person be near homeless and another person be Bill Gates? Uh, how can that be just, they would say. So let's shoot for political policies that mandate or create equity on the fly. Mm -hmm. We'll just redistribute, redistribute, redistribute until we get equity. Why bother with the market process at all? And of course, there's <laughs> there's great reason to avoid such things. For example, uh, I mean, number one, when you when you violate the free association that creates prosperity, you're going to shrink the economic pie. You won't have anything to divvy up anymore because all the natural human instincts will be Instead of being shunted towards productive behavior, they'll be shunting towards the opposite. If everybody gets the same, well, why should anybody work hard? Yeah, I, I would say that we're in the business here in this show of human flourishing, increasing human flourishing. And what this does is it doesn't, it's not the flourishing, the idea of this equity thing, this amorphous idea of equity is not encouraging human flourishing. It's bringing down you know the the level of humanity down to the lowest common denominator almost but the problem is it's advocated by the political and cultural left which i've argued in the past they base all their policies for the most part and i yet to see any different on emotion as opposed to rationality or fact or whatever and i, I think there needs to be some sort of empathy involved for all these people, but the policy prescription <laughs> based on pure emotion. And it really, in this case, I want to say that it's primarily motivated by jealousy of the other, of a more successful person or class of people in the society, you know, economically successful, monetarily successful, that they want to tear those people down. And it's Marxism in action. I think to be fair, it's both. Okay. They, I think they feel resentment and jealousy towards people who are super high wealth, mm -hmm. but they also obviously feel compassion for the homeless and people, you know, starving in the streets. It, it's not just the one thing. Right. Oh yeah. But yeah. There's a, yeah. It's trying to, trying to bring both of those down to, or up, bring one up and then another one down to meet in the quote unquote middle, which is like, just, ugh. Yeah. I think their biggest. The biggest problem of the left is they let's give them full credit for wanting good things, wanting yeah. people to be happy, but they don't really understand how wealth is generated. So the, their prescriptions for, for divvying it about destroy that mechanism, which is a shame. But I like to compare it to the climate thing. Uh -huh. Like the general principle is if you want things to get better, you want to encourage policies that make a society wealthy. And you can see it with the environment. Uh, I said climate, but I meant environment. If you want people to care about the environment that they live in, they first have to not be starving anymore. They have to solve the economic abundance problem first. And once they've done that, once their kids aren't starving, once they've got that kind of base level of comfort, then they look around and go, oh, well, we gotta, really ought to clean up, clean up where we live too. That's why you get a flourishing of parks and forests. And, but that doesn't happen until you get rich. Right. And it's sort of the same with this, with this economic thing. I think all of us want our fellow man to not suffer in the streets. You know, we, we don't want this homeless situation, for example. But the way you solve that isn't to break the engine of societal prosperity. It's to unleash it. And once that happens, once we get rich, obviously, people's heartstrings don't turn off once they become wealthy. They become expanded. You're once right. your material needs are met, well, now you want to help your fellow man. So obviously, it's not taxation and theft that and barking orders at people that would make that happen. It would just let them be free to create their own charitable organizations to go tackle this problem. And uh, I wish the left trusted in that mechanism more. They they see the government cudgel as the only path towards solving any societal woe. And it's, it's a shame because it's the only one that can't work. Right. <laughs> Almost any other thing could work except government power. Yeah. And I don't know if you're going to talk about it, necessarily but it's kind of the the difference between the keynesian framework keynesian idea of how an economy should be structured and the hayekian idea mm. which will provide there's a couple of pretty cool videos that adam alerted me to uh, <laughs> uh, with 
a rap battle between an uh, actor playing Keynes and an actor playing uh, Hayek. And Hayek, yeah. Hopefully those are embedded in the show notes page of the last episode, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I think so. And uh, it, we'll link to it again because, you know, these things all run together, Adam. Yeah, those were fun. <laughs> and as you, I think you were alluding to, the themes are very commensurate, you know? Right. The Hayek vision versus the Keynes vision. It's a very similar idea to the uh, free association versus, you know, a government mandate as far as lifting people up from the. Yeah, you're right. And I think what happens is at least in the end of part one and the battle, we see that Keynes, Keynes emerges victorious and he has in this society. People know, some people know Huge. about Hayek, yeah. uh, but not He's definitely winning. Not, and <laughs> and actually winning. not. That many people probably know of or who Keynes was, but his policies are, are dominant. And it's like, well, no, we're, we're talking about the government just you give people money, they become rich. It's like this universal basic income, UBI kind of thing. It's like the government's going to give everybody a certain amount of dollars per month and then everybody will become a thousand dollars richer, say, for instance. It's like. Uh, dude, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you might have a thousand more dollars in your pocket, but that that thousand dollars isn't worth what it is now because you have to just create this out of thin air. And then guess what? Oh, if everybody has a thousand more dollars, that just raises the baseline. <laughs> You're still at the same right. baseline for crying out loud. It's like it's so insane to think about. And that's equity in action, I think, is what they want to do with this universal basic income idea and you know god forbid you speak out against it because you're you're a heartless cruel animal <laughs> yeah you're absolutely right I, I think it's pretty easy to tear down equity you know on the one sense um it would shrink the pie we would all get poor and then no matter what government policy was instituted to actually make us equal economically if you allow free transactions of any kind the next day, we're not equal anymore. So you just have to keep <laughs> keep stealing, keep redistributing as the pie keeps getting smaller and smaller. So equity, I think, is pretty easy to demolish. Uh, but I think we should go ahead and demolish equality of opportunity, too, <laughs> because that's just as bad. And people don't seem to think that it is. Well, I would say that it just reflexively, I would agree with or I did agree with equality of opportunity. It's like everybody deserves to have the same opportunities, don't they? Well, then you start getting into what what does deserve mean? And then with like this equity thing, what is what is fair? And it's like, well, what you think and what I think. And what specifically would you have to do to actually make all of us have the same equality of opportunity? Sure. If you're Bill Gates's kid, for example, <laughs> and you grow up among the rich and the powerful, what in the world can be done to make some kid from the ghetto have an equal opportunity to Bill Gates's kid? It's impossible. It's impossible. Definitionally it's just impossible. impossible. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so what are we really talking? What we're really talking about are certain government policies that they would the institutors would claim have the effect of equalizing the equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I submit that that's just crazy and nonsense. It's putting the thumb on the scale. You have all the bad actor incentive problems for the people involved. I mean, look what Harvard admissions did trying to make things equal opportunity for admission to their college. You know, they screwed everything up. Yeah. Screwing up, you know, Asians and specifically because historically they do better on tests. You yeah. know? So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to make them less, give them less opportunity in favor of some other marginalized group? It's just criminal and, and farcical. Yes. It's almost like you engaged in a program that was nonsensical and antithetical to reality in the first place. Mm. Almost like that. Yeah. What do we do? Like, so the, the discussion and you're getting back to the equity versus equality, that's the discussion that a lot of people are having and, you know, the nominal left versus the nominal right, the left say is on a the side of equity or right to say like, well, no, we, we need equality. And then we're over here. I would argue that I'm certainly on the right, but we're over here outside of the whole argument and not even in this whole political spectrum. I don't know that it necessarily matters political or cultural spectrum, but just the reality that this is just obfuscating 
the idea that freedom and free association yeah. <laughs> matter. Yeah. Yeah, bingo. And they're the only things that do, really. And more to the point, you know, it's not like what people do when they freely associate is so wonderful. It could be kind of horrible. You know, people well, oftentimes could have, it is. Yeah, people could be racist, misogynistic, whatever. And in their actions and their freely associating actions, you know, they could do kind of stuff we wouldn't approve of. Mm -hmm. But it's worse to pretend that you have the power to impose your vision on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That meta crime is is much, much bigger and much more destructive to civilization than whatever, you know, whatever one shopkeep owner, you know, might or might not do with his ability to freely disassociate. Mm -hmm. Freedom is always better because the the alternative is worse, even if it's you that's that's given the godlike power to intervene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then the subject comes up. Well, if we have, you know, unabated freedom, well, God forbid we have unabated freedom. I mean, I would disagree with my 2011 self in this article that I mentioned and that it's not good. I, I believe that it is. But the, the, what you get is a, a pushback from folks. And it's hard to actually argue unless you're on the side of unabated freedom. You get the pushback. It's like, well, you know, then, you know, I, black folks can't eat at my lunch counter like if i don't want them there they they can't eat there it was like well um that's a, that's a hard one to kind of get into the discussion about but i would argue it's like well just don't eat there these people are the, these people are evil you don't right. you don't eat there in the first place you don't want to eat at the evil evil guys restaurant exactly but let's, i don't know if that's the easiest let's go ahead and assert let's yeah. go ahead and assert put it on the table that it is evil for this diner owner to discriminate in such a way and right. not let black people or midgets or redheads or who whoever he hates. Yeah. It's evil for him to discriminate in such a way. But the problem is the second that you put yourself in the position of some overlord mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to force you to associate with who I want you to, you're you're creating an even bigger evil. And people have and the right does this too. It's not just the left. Sure. Your former self from 2011 had the same problem. Mm -hmm. It's perfectly normal to look at what actually happens in society if free people are, are acting freely, a complete laissez-faire free market, and say, oh, I wish things were different. Mm -hmm. I, I want I want it to look, I want there to be 12 ice cream parlors, not just two. You know, there's a there's a market uh, market failure. But who the hell are you? You know, who the hell are you to impose your vision on the desires of all these people acting freely? You're grabbing the ring of power from, you know, from Sauron <laughs> and, and and taking that evil upon yourself. You can't do it. it. It's 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 worse. Trust freedom. Trust free people associating freely. That racist diner, he's going to go out of business because guess what? <laughs> Being a racist jerk isn't popular. Right. I guess, yeah, take it out of the theoretical into the practical. And the last three years, it has nothing to do with skin color, creed, religion. Well, maybe maybe it does have to do with religion, the whole COVID nonsense. Now, mm. these people <laughs> would not allow, if you didn't have a mask, a lot of these places would not allow you in. Now, there's some gray area, whether that was... I don't I don't believe there was any law that was ever passed that said you had to wear a mask in public or in, at any public place. But like you said, the overlord part of the government would say, well, we, we're telling you, you have to do this now, whether it's a law or not. And then folks would either have to wear a mask or couldn't go in or couldn't go in the place without. Yeah, it was a law. It just wasn't legislation. These were temporary executive power okay. edicts so, in places like Los Angeles and everywhere. New York. And, yeah. and if you violated it, the, the, the lever that they would pull is to take away your business license, mm -hmm. you know, come in with the cops and shut you down. Yeah. And so if, if I chose to say on my own to wear a mask into a grocery store, now people aren't, it looks stupid, but. They're not disallowing you for coming in if you're wearing a mask. But on the other hand, two years ago, if you came, <laughs> if you came in not wearing a mask, that, that was flip. It's like, well, and we know now, and we, I would argue I, we knew then that none of this makes sense. It's just a way for them to have control over you. And what the ultimate yeah, motivation was, uh... I'm not 
other than just the pure control and seeing if this will work. But that kind of delves in more to the conspiracy angle. And I just I think that these people are, while evil, they're not bright enough to carry out a conspiracy of such epic proportions. They're just a lot of stupid people acting in nefarious ways. That's what I would. I yeah, would let's argue. not delve into the the nuts and bolts of the science and the conspiracy because <laughs> that'll take us five or six episodes. Yeah. But the basic principle is simple, and it has to be that whether the customers and employees are wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, that has to be decided at the level of the individual property owner because of a very simple principle you know my house my rules and you don't have to necessarily come in if you don't want to agree with my rules but those are the conditions it's a hayekian principle it's bottom up order not top down imposed order and this is where the right really pisses me off because mm-hmm. they <laughs> they will say that the only real problem with the incredible government restrictions imposed top down was that they happened to get the science of the of the COVID wrong. It wasn't as deadly, you know, as 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 they claimed. But if it was, well, then then it would be just fine for the government to impose all these edicts. Like, man, no, you just no. don't get it. The principle is the same. The principle does not change based on either the lethality or the virology or uh, virality of the particular COVID virus. Right. And uh, they just don't get that because they love to impose their vision of order from the top to the right is no different than the left in that regard. Yeah. And I get into this discussion. I don't know that this necessarily want to go, but getting this discussion with some people, it's like, well, yeah, we needed to, we needed to lock down at first because whatever reason it's like, no, you, but you it's that this co- goes it, back to the freedom of association. If yes. you think it's so bad, don't, Go to that place. And I see when the, when the person or you're talking about your makes place. that statement, and they make that statement. It's like, well, it was OK to do it for the first few weeks. What they're doing is looking at the entire world and insisting that everybody should or, should obey their specific orders. Me, me, Jimmy, you all should do exactly <laughs> what I say. It's the impulse to power. It's yeah. gross. It's lascivious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it kind of goes back to. Well, yeah, it, it is. It is gross, but it, it goes back to the this these definitional things of what is fair, what is what do we deserve? It's like, well, I don't know. I think I have an idea of fairness that might totally run opposite to you. So if I start using what's fair, well, who's who's the arbiter there again? It's like it's so stupid. Each individual human heart. Each, each individual yeah. mind. And that's the point. That's why not these only, things have not to only be decided between locally. You and me, it's between yeah. other people. And my, you think my five-year-old son thinks what's fair? <laughs> this is like things I do to, you know, the for the betterment of his life are fair? No, if he, if he had his own way, things would go a lot different. We could see how that goes and that's fine. Yeah, fairness isn't a, a platonic ideal. Fairness is a negotiation sure between each two people or each group of people. And that is why it is all the more evil when some concept of fairness is imposed on 330 million people, say, all at once, uh, decided by a legislator or executive uh, office holder. Mm -hmm. It's perverse because there's no such thing as fairness. It has to literally be negotiated between all actors on the ground. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, because we care about one another and prosperity, you know, we, we grope clumsily towards a good notion of fairness and we all improve in the effort reminds me a little bit of like what we were talking about in a previous episode about the marginal revolution where it's uh, the the idea of fairness in this case is negotiated to the point of it's whatever the next thing is 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 the fair thing right (laughs) it's so funny the more you delve into these the nuts and bolts of these the quote unquote four pillars that uh, that undergird and define our our podcast, the more you keep seeing the same things. Mm-hmm. I'm not a particularly religious person, but when I see the same themes keep occurring, uh, you know, bottom up being better than top down, you know, just over and over and over. It's like, huh, well, maybe there is a a natural order, mm-hmm. shall we say, right <laughs> to this this life we live. Yeah, and that is you know whole whole another thing. Like it's you can explain it in many different ways, and uh, 
Then you well, have to. And you have to. And you have to have a framework yeah. of otherwise, like, what, where are we going and what are we doing? And, you know, each... We'll just take turns ordering each other around. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. that, that just leaves us leads us back into the cave starving. Perhaps that is a the natural order of what society has been Boy, over the course I, brother, of time. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> not in the future in the in the in the past and we we tend to learn from the past i don't know that people often necessarily glean the lessons of what maybe is out there in a, in a large scale but hopefully we start moving that way and i think just this show and talking about ideas that you know nobody really wants to talk about are kind of moving people in that right in that direction that i think is good and like in this discussion in particular the focus is equity versus equality and we say no screw you <laughs> like we, yep. we need throw the, both the, away. the argument they is totally idols. different the argument is yeah, totally it's, different and it's you, freedom yeah you're just doing a little puppet show over here while the real real thing's going on exactly. around the corner so any uh, last words of wisdom before we no, not really except maybe just one slight general one mm -hmm. when you hear the national conversation is equity versus equality. Take two steps back and think to yourself, hmm, maybe they're not showing me the entire field here. Maybe I need a, a, a deeper analysis because maybe neither one of those choices is the right one. Yeah. Well, how about, and hopefully do this real quick, but same thing goes with Democrat, Republican. It's like, oh, th Amen. these are these are the arguments, Democrats and then Republicans. <laughs> Let's just meet in the middle. It's like, no. <laughs> no. How about we look at their arguments and maybe come up with an entirely different framework or solution to this whole thing? And that's kind of... Look, it's democracy. We have a choice here. We can either cut off five of your fingers or seven of your fingers. <laughs> it's not like you're not getting a choice. Pick one. Six. <laughs> the idea is... You cut off six of your fingers. <laughs> the compromise is six. <laughs> the sensible middle, Brian. The sensible yeah, middle. Yeah. Yeah. This is whatever, how crazy our society is. But, you know, whatever. We're, our people are not that crazy, and our people are going to be leading uh, the force in the future. The natural order, if you will. The natural order. Yeah. So, all right, Adam, until next time, we, we shall uh, chat at you down the road. All right, buddy. Good talking to you. Bye. And for more, head on over to naturalorderpodcast.com. Wouldn't you rather be a hammer than a nail? Yes, I think you would. If you only could, you surely would. That's where Tom Woods Liberty Classroom comes in. You will now be the hammer. Get the equivalent of a PhD in libertarian thought and free market economics, all for less than $8 a month. Liberty Classroom is the premier, what we call a dashboard university. You can attend while sitting in front of your computer, on a road trip, or simply driving around town. Go to briandoleary.com slash liberty to sign up today.